everyone, and welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, a podcast where our goal is to read the entire Bible in a year, seeking to understand God's plan of redemption while discovering daily and practically your part in it. Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we are jumping into Isaiah. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 1 to 4. Uh, we're moving into a prophetic book. If you're curious why we are doing that, yesterday we were reading over uh, 2 Kings 15 and 2 Chronicles 26. Um, we covered King Uzziah. King Uzziah was fairly faithful. He became a king when he was about 16. Um, but he ends up doing this like weird prideful spiral um, where he tries to offer the incense in the temple on his own and then is struck with leprosy. The reason that we're jumping into Isaiah is that Isaiah was prophesying um, during Uzziah and then into Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. That is in chapter 1 of Isaiah. And so we can place Isaiah as a prophet in Judah specifically. So this is in the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom uh, obviously contains Jerusalem and the temple in it. Um, it is like sort of the more faithful nation. It doesn't get judged as quickly as Israel does in the north. And so what we've been getting in Kings and Chronicles is kind of the... <laughs> this is goofy, but sort of the perspectives of the kings. Obviously, that's what the title means. Um, what we're going to do now as we cover some of these prophets is get the message that the prophets are delivering to those kings, and we'll kind of be reading those back and forth so that you can see what the kings are doing and then also what the prophets are speaking. Mm -hmm. And this opens up as saying this is the vision of Isaiah um, as he saw it concerning Judah and Jerusalem. But it's interesting, I think he's he's talking about things that will happen in Jerusalem, but he's speaking on behalf of the kingship of those four, one, two, wait, one, two, three, four, yeah, four kings of Judah. So that's kind of interesting. So it's not necessarily the perspective of the Jerusalem kings or the Israel, kings of Israel, right? Right, it's, it's, it's from, from the... Isaiah as the word of the Lord um, to the kings and to the nation. Of Judah. Of Judah, right. And so you can you can place Isaiah um, during Uzziah. Uzziah began to reign around 760 BC. Um, most likely, Isaiah began to prophesy around 740 BC. And that is only 10 or 20 years before the northern kingdom of Israel is judged and carried into exile. Um, and then Hezekiah, I think Hezekiah is the final king that is listed in chapter one. Um, Hezekiah begins to reign around 715. So just to give you like a little bit of a snapshot of where this lands, as far as the date, you can assume we're talking um, 740, you know, 740, 700, whatever, BC, uh, very close to when the northern kingdom of Israel is judged and carried off. And then the southern kingdom of Judah will be judged and carried off like 150 to 200 years later. But one common thread, though, a common thread of these four chapters is that there is, like, severe, um, I guess, lack of clean heart or pure heart in the worship that they are, um, I guess, the worship that they're doing. So all the right steps are there, but they're not necessarily, like, going about it in such a way that their hearts are pure and, um, I guess, really honoring God. So that is interesting. That's like something that gets pointed out over and over and over again. Uh, but we've seen that also in like prior books as well. So like priests and I mean, what did, what were we reading? We were reading, hmm, what was it? Judges, I guess. Like towards the end of Judges, like everybody's going through all the steps, but like they're doing it completely wrong. Um, they've got priests with prostitutes and like all kinds of crazy stuff. So it's like you can go through the motions and put on like a totally fake whatever, but God knows the hearts and knows whether or not your worship is is true or if you're just doing it just because it's a thing to do. So you're referring specifically to chapter 1 verse 11 ish. Um, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices says the Lord. I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. 
when you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. Mm -hmm. New moon and Sabbath are the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. Your new moons and appointed feasts my soul hates. So this is strong, strong language from the Lord. But any possible way that you could be worshiping or like honoring God, though, too, with all of those things that you just listed, he completely hates or abhors. Well, look at look at verse 16, then wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, Mm -hmm. seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Like, I, I mean, first of all, we have this consistent theme throughout the entire message of scripture care for widows and orphans. Mm -hmm. Um, James makes it explicit. True religion is caring for widows and orphans. The prophets are explicit care for widows and orphans. Leviticus demands caring for widows and orphans. So you get the feeling here um, just from Isaiah chapter one. Obviously there's more here to cover, but you get the feeling that they were running through the motions. Like the, the sacrifices were still being offered. The incense was still being burned. Mm-hmm. But the heart behind all of it was becoming so distant from God. And so you get the picture that it is possible to do all the religious things and go through all the correct motions to sing all the right songs and perform all the right whatever ways, ways of mm-hmm. worship and still be far from God mm-hmm. because your life doesn't match your worship. Mm-hmm. How often do we even like, I was talking about that earlier. How often we do we see that kind of stuff today or even participate in that stuff today? Um, or like I was also thinking, so in the New Testament, when do we hear of these types of um, like comments being made throughout scripture? Like your heart does not reflect your works. Like how, like does God single that out? We were kind of talking about that earlier. Uh, and you had mentioned a couple of like references where, yeah, that is still existent for the church today, post Jesus. Yeah, I mean, we're not we're not post Jesus. Like like Jesus has always post been Jesus here. death on the cross. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> but it it is like it it's not like this happened in the Old Testament. It doesn't happen today. Like the the first um, the the church in First Corinthians. Uh, first and second Corinthians, the church in Corinth, they were dealing with all kinds of craziness. They were embracing all kinds of things that were not in favor of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Uh, They had a dude that was um, just practicing sexual immorality and they were like lifting him up and honoring him um, because they thought it brought more attention to God's grace. And Paul was like, dude, that that is not how this works. Like, don't do that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, their, their services were just kind of crazy. Um, they were chasing after all kinds of spiritual experiences, but Paul was asking them to pursue more order and like edify the body more. That's like um, almost that same idea of cheap grace that we've talked yep. about in the past. Yep. Huh. Um, James is talking to people about faith without works. Um, why, why would he say that unless it was mm-hmm. a valuable lesson? Um, I think about Paul talking to the Romans in, in Romans, just about like, Hey, like if you turn away from the Lord, he turns you over and you do all kinds of crazy things Mm -hmm. and you fall further and further into sin. Um, Romans contains that line, like, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Yeah. Um, so, so humanity is drawn away from God often and, Many times when we are being drawn away from God, we continue to have all these like religious appearances that continue to make us feel good about the fact that our souls are being poisoned. Mm-hmm. And I think about like there, there's definitely times in my own life. Um, I can think about times like when I was in high school where like I, I hated God. I was very much against God. Um, but I was still leading worship at my church mm-hmm. and people, people loved that I was leading worship at my church. And it was like, oh, wow, I don't, I'm not even sure I believe in God. Like, I'm not even sure I believe in God. And if I do, I definitely hate him. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, that's not, we don't want the hallmark of our faith experience to be, you know, 
worship for appearance's sake. Well, yeah, and I think even like that, that like, <laughs> it sounds silly, but that sin that you were talking about that you were dealing with was like an actual disbelief and like oh, yeah. hatred towards God. But if you're thinking about the context even of scripture, like it doesn't have to be even something that... That sounds so silly, I guess, but like that substantial, like hating God. Yeah. Like King Uzziah was dealing literally yeah. with pride. So like that is where this book is kind of sweeping in, like with that same perspective. Like he fell off of like, I don't know, he fell off of where he was supposed to be at simply because he had so much pride that he thought he was way better than what he was supposed to be. Or just he didn't have any humility, I guess. Um, and that was, like, the downfall of him. So I think and no matter what sin you're dealing with, it can definitely screw with your ability to serve God and with a pure heart. And jo God chose to correct him as he was doing a religious act. Mm -hmm. Like, he wanted to mm -hmm. walk into the temple and offer incense. And God was like, hey, you're, you're not allowed to do this. This is... You're not going to do and the this. The priest said that too. Yeah. Get out of here. Um, so in Isaiah chapter four, just to call this out, and this is going to be a developing theme in the book of Isaiah. Um, chapter four is talking about some of the restoration that will occur after judgment. And chapter four, verse two says, in that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. Then the, when, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning. Um, the, chapter 4 is looking ahead to this time of restoration. And you will see that the branch of the Lord is kind of a recurring theme that's in a couple of the different prophetic books. And a lot of people believe this is an allusion to the Messiah. The mm -hmm. Messiah will come and the Messiah will restore uh, what has been broken. And so here it is. The branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious and be part of the restoration of the people of Judah. And so we believe that ultimately that is looking at Jesus. Um, there's going to be even more explicit um, expressions of who Jesus is in Isaiah. We'll get to that later on. I was just going to say, too, to add to what you were talking about, about this, like, idea of the Messiah or, like, this pro this prophecy of the Messiah coming. Verses 3 and 4 uh, also talk about the, the Lord will have washed away the filth and cleansed the bloodstains. So our Bible talks about how this is a permanent remedy that will be applied to God's people. So that is, like, that's really cool, too. Because this is all talking about, like, how oh, you guys are doing all these things. It doesn't actually matter because you're terrible hearts. But someday, I, like, the Lord will send someone who will wash away all of this permanently. We won't have to deal with any of the crazy stuff that you guys are pretending to do right now. So that's kind of crazy, too. I really like those, those connections and prophetic pieces that just all come back to it. So the challenge for today is to be authentic in your worship. Like, come to the Lord and offer worship to the Lord through your, you know, your works, your deeds, your life. Um, live your life as a living sacrifice to God that is holy and pleasing to God. Uh, we do not want to be caught up in some kind of prophecy where God is saying like, you know what, I'm sick of your worship, knock it off. Uh, just remember to be faithful to the Lord in what you're doing today. Hey, before we sign off for today, just one final thing. Uh, we picked up a subscriber uh, this week, so shout out to Dave from Lancaster. Uh, thank you so much for continuing to listen to us. Thank you so much for continuing to support us. Uh, if you are interested in supporting the podcast, you can do that with the link in our description. Uh, thanks so much, Dave, and we'll be, back, <laughs> we'll be back again tomorrow. We'll see you then. Thanks so much for listening to God's Plan, Your Part. If anything stuck out to you, if you have any questions, or if you'd like to receive a Bible, you can email us at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting us through the link in our description. We love that you're on this journey with us, and we hope you have a great day. See you tomorrow.